All right, so welcome to Eat, Move, Think, the show about optimal wellness brought to you by MyCan. Wow. Oh, I was practicing. <laughs> okay, ready? <clears throat> welcome, welcome, welcome to Eat, Move, Think, Think, the show about optimal, optimal, optimal wellness brought, brought to you, you by MyCan. Yeah, that, this is extremely good. Thank you. So in general, our listeners, this podcast are quite healthy people, I'd say. Yes. The type of people who at the end of the week are probably keeping a tally of, you know, like how many workouts they get in, how many healthy meals they ate, how many hours of sleep they got, keeping a tally of your health metrics. It's always in the back of your mind if you're someone who's really interested in health and wellness. Totally. Okay. So yeah. So health metrics that you track, number of drinks that yeah. you had probably. Yes. Amount of stress. I don't yeah. know. That's not something that's easily conducive to numbers, though, but it's it's something you think about, I think. It's something you realize that you maybe need a relaxing time after a particularly stressful day. Sure. But what about loneliness or the amount of times that you see a friend or a loved one in so that it's week? Social connections. Yeah. I mean, I don't think about that. That's not a tally that my Apple Watch tracks for sure. Or it's certainly not easy to measure either. And some people prefer more socialization. Some people like to be alone more than others. And that even changes as you get older. But is it something like, does it have anything to do with your health? I don't know. Well, according to our guest today, it has more of an impact on our health than something like obesity. Wow, really? Yeah. Our guest today has been doing research on loneliness and isolation for more than 20 years. And she's learned that loneliness is as bad for our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day in wow. the long term. Wow. Wow. So connect more with friends, have more social attachments. But how is loneliness really related to a physical health condition like cardiovascular disease or high blood pressure? Is there a secret number of relationships that you need for optimal health and wellness? And say you're starting out in a new place or you've been isolated for a long time. How do you break that cycle and start to create new connections? I'm Jazz. I'm Chris. We're the producers of Eat, Move, Think, and... And in episode 167 of Eat, Move, Think, MedCan Mind Station lead Jennifer Baldishin sits down with Dr. Julianne holt Lundstad. She's a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Brigham Young University. She researches the effects of loneliness and isolation on our health, which are actually not the same thing. What? So loneliness and isolation are two different things. Yeah. Even though we use them interchangeably. We seem to often, and that's something that our guest today differentiates, so it's important stuff. This sounds fascinating. I can't wait to listen. Let's get to the interview. Grab a friend and listen to this one with your friend. Here's MedCan Mind Station lead, Jennifer Baldishin. Hello, and welcome back to Eat, Move, Think. I'm Jennifer Baldishin. Dr. Holt Lundstad, I am so excited to meet with you today. So how are you today? I'm great. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Also, <laughs> you've been doing a lot of research on loneliness and health for several years. This isn't a new topic for you. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you got started with all this and how did all of this lead to your interest in studying social connections? Yeah, you know, the journey began during my training in graduate school. We were interested in how our bodies respond and how that might vary based on psychological and social processes, including stress and how that relates to our connections to others. So, you know, how our relationships can help us cope with stress um, and buffer some of these effects of stress, but how, also how our relationships can be sources of stress. And in this work, of course, it's all with the understanding that these physiological processes, when sustained over time, have health implications. And it really became quite clear to me that while myself and my colleagues who are doing this kind of research recognized it, the general public, when we would talk about connection or lack thereof, it was really viewed as more of related to emotional well-being, not not actually physical health. And so this led me down the road, you know, later in my career, running my own lab, really looking at the global data and the epidemiological data on how our relationships impact our lifespan and, and the extent to which this predicts premature mortality. 
So this work really evolved over time, looking at the overall protective effects, as well as the overall risks um, associated with that was somewhat of an evolutionary process of trying to go from a micro level lens of this issue to the big picture issue and everything in between. (laughs) Um, And and now really focusing on expanding that even farther to um, understanding some of the nuances in that and um, what we can do, of course, to reduce risks. Well, it's so true that the mind and the body are connected. You know, when you have a thought, it's just electrical impulses, but your body really reacts as if those electrical impulses are actually happening right here, right now. So when you have a thought or a worry or, you know, like you said, these family interactions that could potentially cause stress, and stress can even be an excited, happy thing, but your body reacts to always try to protect you. Yes. And in fact, in some of those laboratory-based studies, we even had people just think about various interactions that they'd had with with others. And even just thinking about it or anticipating about to interact with someone, we could see changes in people's physiology. And so not only is it happening real time, but even just these thoughts can be enough to activate some of these physiological signals. And and as you say, oftentimes these are to protect us. And because humans are social species, and we've needed to rely on others throughout human history, it's been adaptive to be a part of a group and being alone is actually dangerous. (laughs) And so whether it's trying to be alert to various threats, to having to just deal with the demands of everyday life on your own, that requires more energy. And so these physiological processes are the energy needed to meet these kinds of demands. Well, this is so interesting, especially now that we're all coming out of this pandemic. And even though the research that you did was prior to the pandemic, I don't know if you're being asked more and more to speak to people now, but to look at what affects it possibly long-term or short-term being isolated had on us. And when I was speaking to clients I didn't like the idea of social isolation or that we had to keep our distance, but I felt like physically we had to keep our distance, but not emotionally. Like we had to still stay connected and we had to get creative, but not to lose that sense of togetherness. Yeah, yeah. I think the term social distancing was an unfortunate one. You know, it really probably should have been physical distancing. I agree. Um, Yeah. (laughs) You know, we had very good evidence of long term implications of being isolated and lonely. The one thing that is somewhat of a silver lining in this is that it created greater awareness. Prior to the pandemic, we already had good evidence of, of concerning trends. But there was, to some extent, a lot of stigma around it. So people didn't want to talk about it. Uh, And I think that we all, to some extent, really got a taste of what it's like. We either experienced it profoundly ourselves, or we witnessed people close to us, those that we love, suffer as a result of this. And so we all really have a a better appreciation of how important our relationships and our connections to others are. And I think that that, you know, is, is certainly manifest in terms of the desire to want to be together, the desire to want to travel and, and see those that we care about. This goes beyond emotional well-being. It goes beyond mental health. This actually has well-documented documented impacts on our physiology, our physical health, puts us at risk for chronic disease and puts us at risk for premature mortality. And so we really do need to recognize the importance of this because there were already concerning trends prior to the pandemic and the pandemic just exacerbated that. Um, Really just getting back to normal is not going to be enough. Um, we really need to do more. I I definitely don't want to 
lose that train because that's really interesting when you say do more. But let's go back to what you were saying about the physiological changes, because mentally, that's obviously another piece we have to talk about, the difference between uh, social isolation and being lonely. I know that those are topics that we have to you know, separate. But when you talk about mental health effects as well as physical health effects, can you be more specific about um, some of the things you've seen in your studies physically about what happens when you're when you're isolated or or alone in a negative sense lonely right right first of all we've been able to document multiple pathways by which this this can impact our physiology and ultimately health i should mention that this cuts across things like cardiovascular functioning, neuroendocrine functioning, immune functioning, and that this is associated with dysregulation. So I'll kind of walk you through one of these pathways. So for instance, being isolated or feeling lonely can trigger a sense of threat in the central nervous system. So activating the central nervous system can activate various aspects, including the release of norepinephrine. So, you know, trying to activate somewhat similar to what people often think of as a fight or flight response, but this norepinephrine for instance, can be released, go to the bone marrow, priming an inflammatory response, for example. So heightened inflammation, while that might be adaptive in the short term, if you were to you know, have some kind of injury, we know that chronic inflammation, so if this is activated and, and sustained uh, systemically more longer term, chronic inflammation has been linked to a number of chronic illnesses, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, but it's also been linked to mental health conditions and cognitive health conditions such as dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And so that's just an example of one of these biological pathways that can help explain how it is that being isolated or lonely is related to what might otherwise seem like very seemingly diverse kinds of outcomes that may all share a common pathway. There's also some evidence to suggest that, for instance, um, with the immune pathway, there's some really interesting line of research that has shown that this has been linked to poor immune responses that include greater susceptibility to cold and flu viruses and a reduced ability to produce and mount an effective immune response to a vaccine. Um, This includes flu vaccines as well as the COVID-19 vaccine. We have evidence of these physiological processes that can lead to both short-term and and long-term kinds of health outcomes. One thing that I was thinking about when you were just mentioning all these physical reactions, like the immune system being compromised, cancer potentially, I know even illnesses like uh, MS are, and autoimmune type diseases can also be triggered by um, mental health situations. Because like you said, there's the mind-body connection and you're in this fight or flight stress response all being triggered. That can happen in a short period of time, and we're dealing with long periods of time. So the body's kind of feeling like it's under threat nonstop for years. But then when I also think about the clients that we see at MedCan, a lot of the clients who I see are feeling lonely. I'm wondering what your suggestions are for some of those people about how to break the cycle when somebody is recently divorced or they've had to move from province to province or country to country because of work. Uh, We have people who are retired, who their social connections had to do with work. And it's really hard, you know, very often when, when they're little kids, it's so easy to become friends with people. They go into the playground, 10 minutes later, they come running up to you and they go, mommy, I just made a new best friend. You know, and we can't do that as adults. It's so much harder. So what's some of your advice to open up that door for people who really want to be socially connected and they're really struggling either because they have so much work and family demands that they just can't start a new hobby or how can people reach out and be with people when they want to be with people? Yeah, that's something that I think that a lot of people struggle with is how to 
create and maintain these relationships, particularly when there are so many other demands on people's time and attention. And it's, as you mentioned, I think complex um, because people can become isolated or lonely. And maybe we maybe we should go back and kind of distinguish between those two as well. And that can occur for a variety of reasons. And so part of really getting to the bottom of it is also understanding what was the underlying cause of that, because sometimes some of those things can be somewhat easier to remedy than others. I'll give you an example where one factor that can contribute to both isolation and loneliness is untreated hearing loss. And so if someone is having trouble hearing conversations and so starts to disengage from these conversations or reduces social contact to avoid embarrassment, um, that this is something that there are relatively effective treatments for that could help someone. Now, I, I, I want to acknowledge that they're not perfect, but where there, there's something that you can tangibly do something about, or, you know, someone who doesn't have transportation, that's a, um, relatively easier than, for instance, someone who's lost their lifelong partner. And other kinds of relationships may help, but um, may not really quite fill the void of of this person. For many of us, we become isolated or lonely because we're working too many hours or we've become mobile and moved somewhere and uprooted ourselves from our um, community of origin and now are trying to create a new community and new connections in, in this new community. And so um, those are in many ways challenging, but are things that may take work. And so some of the ways that we can start to establish kinds, new kinds of connections is really making time in our busy schedules to either get out in our community to start um, making new connections or strengthening the existing ties that we already have. We often have to try and make time in our busy schedules to be physically active. And we need to make time in our busy schedules um, to be socially active. And we really need to start prioritizing our relationships for our health like we do, you know, some of these other things. But I also want to acknowledge that while we think of this as a, a personal issue, There are many barriers that people face that go beyond their own internal barriers and that there are barriers in our society that make it more difficult to connect with other people, whether that is the extent to which are the communities that we live in are are walkable and we can get out in our neighborhoods safely, but the extent to which there are things in our built environment that either facilitate our ability to gather with others, such as spaces and, and centers where, where people can gather, um, but also the kinds of, of practices that occur in our lives and in our communities where many of our workplaces expect us to work well beyond the typical, what we might think of as, you know, eight to five working hours. And um, with many people now, those, um, especially after working remote for many people, these hours can, you know, blend into the evenings and weekends. And we have less ability to separate or maintain and protect our time for our personal life and our our personal relationships outside of our work relationships. And so there are many factors that we need to consider both on a personal level, but also consider how we might need to make changes even at a community or societal level. I think what I really like too, what you were saying about how we have to make time for it, because We always spread the word and how important exercise is. You know, we all talk about that, um, how important sleep is, exercise, sort of those key eating healthy. Those are such key foundations for mental and physical health. And to be able to say we also need to make time for those social interactions, they should be on par. You know, when you look at the research you've done, it's got to be the same one more thing (laughs) that we have to say, look, just as important as exercise, just as important as getting sleep. If you want to be mentally and physically healthy, you also have to spend X amount of time 
daily and weekly to reach out to the people who who you love and who care about you. Absolutely. And if you're really struggling to find that time, exercise with a friend. (laughs) Um, Two for the price of one. Right, right. But, you know, really making time for connecting every single day, just like we need to be physically active and sleep every single day. You'd be surprised at how many people are not taking time for their their relationships. And it's easy for relationships to begin to drift apart or to not be as close. But also in order to establish intimacy within a relationship, you know, from going from being a complete stranger to an acquaintance, take some time going from an acquaintance to a friend, you know, take some time. Um, It's often not like the movies where you're instantly best friends um, (laughs) right after meeting someone. And, and so a lot of these things take time. And, you know, if we want to take the analogy um, a, a bit farther with exercise, you know, it would be like thinking that you could go to the gym or go out and, and do exercise one day and that, you know, somehow that was um, enough. Uh, <laughs> Good point. But it, it's those daily practices that really ultimately create fitness. And and so, you know, we, we really need those daily practices to maintain our, our social fitness. Does it matter what kind of relationship we're talking about? If we're talking about work colleagues or family or intimate or are we just talking about connection in general? All of these kinds of relationships and types of connections that we have have shown to be important, but they may fulfill different kinds of roles or needs within our lives. And so if you think about it, the kinds of needs or goals that might be met by, you know, a romantic partner might be very different than the kinds of, of things that, that are fulfilled by your mom or your sister <laughs> um, or your best friend or your coworkers. Each of these kinds of relationships are, are important and can fulfill different kinds of, of needs. But we also shouldn't dismiss the kinds of relationships and connections that we have with you know, acquaintances and even strangers. There's been some research to suggest that there is importance of, you know, what are called weak ties, you know, the the acquaintances or, you know, the friend of the friend that can often be important sources of information, but also simply even just the people that you say hello to, you know, the checker at the, the grocery store or um, the barista, these kinds of just small interactions, waving and saying hello to a neighbor, that these all can help foster a sense of community and uh, community cohesiveness that can also be important for community level kinds of outcomes, including things like resilience and, you know, the extent to which you can trust those in your community and your neighborhood can significantly predict, for example, um, resilience to and overcoming some kind of crisis or natural hazard or disaster. So neighbors coming together to help each other, if it's flooding or fires or whatever it might be, those are important kinds of outcomes as well. And so um, what we find in the research is that having a, a diversity of types of relationships has been as associated with better kinds of outcomes because these different these different kinds of relationships can fulfill different kinds of needs. And so while close and more intimate relationships might fulfill more emotional kinds of needs, these other relationships can be important for filling other kinds of needs. It really brings out a sense of belonging, right? That it's not just you against the world, but you feel like you're part of a bigger community. Absolutely. (laughs) And I think each different interaction you have with a different person brings out a different side of who you are. So then you can feel more more fulfilled as well, because certain interests may show up more with your best friend. Other interests may show up with people you spend time with at work or at home. Um, We're not one dimensional. Absolutely. (laughs) You mentioned earlier on that we should come back to the difference between being isolated and being lonely. Do you want to talk a little bit about the difference of those two words? Yeah, we often use the terms interchangeably, and they are related, but they are distinct. The way in which we often distinguish them is that isolation is really objectively more being objectively alone, 
or having few relationships or infrequent social contact. And so it's relatively quantifiable, whereas loneliness is more the subjective feeling alone. And I should say distressing feeling of of being alone that's often defined as stemming from the perceived discrepancy between one's desired level of connection and one's actual level of connection. So when we are objectively alone, we're more likely to feel alone. (laughs) Um, And so that's where these two things can often go hand in hand, but they don't always. So for example, we can be objectively alone, but not feel lonely. And we've all probably experienced a time where we actually took some pleasure in in a moment of solitude. But similarly, we may not be objectively isolated. We could be surrounded by others and yet still feel profoundly lonely. And many of us can think of a time where we were maybe even at a party or a social gathering and yet felt quite lonely. These are our experiences that you know most of us can all relate to. And the distinction though is maybe important in terms of how we approach and, and address these things. So another way in which neuroscientists have thought of this is that loneliness can be viewed as a biological signal, much like hunger and thirst. And so just like hunger is kind of an unpleasant feeling that that motivates us to seek out food, that loneliness is an unpleasant feeling that motivates us to reconnect socially. So in both cases, they are adaptive because they signal that something essential for survival is lacking. And so from that standpoint, loneliness in the short term can be adaptive, but it's when those needs are left unmet, that this can become maladaptive. Um, And so just like, you know, if we were to not meet the needs of food, that that could impact our survival. Similarly, if we don't meet our social needs, that that can impact survival. So one of the things to think about is that in both cases, if these are short term, isolation and loneliness, so moments of solitude can be adaptive in the short term. But if we are either lonely or isolated for long periods of time, this can be associated with risk. And so, you know, I think that a common misperception that even if we don't feel lonely, that there's no risk involved. But if you're chronically isolated for long periods of time, that has been linked to a number of risks, including risks for premature mortality. And interestingly, there may be some evidence that over time, that these signals may become somewhat off um, in the sense that where we may continue to feel lonely for long periods of time, even though we're around other people, or we may be isolated for long periods of time and lose that sense of loneliness. Much like if you go without food long enough, you lose some of those hunger pains. Sometimes those signals in the long term can become a little off. So we have to be really careful about the chronic effects of of both isolation and loneliness. And it's interesting, it is very subjective because it's the chronic piece that's so important because I think that we're so busy in our daily lives with work and family and self-care that sometimes you feel like you have to do and all these things that you really want to have just a weekend where you do nothing and you just have peace and quiet and just like turn off electronics and just read and just be be alone. But that's not what we're talking about or those, the introverts who just don't want to go out after work because their bandwidth is just done. But that, that's different than the chronic loneliness. Like you said, a little bit is important to just kind of regroup. But when it becomes a problem, then it's a problem. You know, the examples you were giving, I think we can all relate to, but when that becomes a consistent pattern over time, that can become problematic. And, you know, one thing I should mention that I think becomes somewhat of a a misperception is that perhaps because introverts may prefer time alone, that they may not be at risk for loneliness. And actually data suggests that introverts may be at greater risk for loneliness. And so um, we can't just assume that because someone is introverted, that they may not be at risk and may not need our support. And that 
the way in which those social needs and the preferences for those, how those social needs being met may differ, but the social needs are still there. And so we just have to be careful about preferences. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's also about quality, not quantity. We don't need hundreds and hundreds of people in our life. We need one or two people that if we're not feeling good, someone's going to reach out and, and say, hey, I've been thinking of you. How are you doing? It's that connection that we need. It's the quality of that interaction, not the quantity. You know, that's true to a certain extent. But again, to be able to get some of that diversity in our networks, we need some quantity (laughs) beyond one. Because if we only have one, we're at greater risk because if that one relationship that we rely on is threatened in any way, so you move or you lose that relationship, whether that's through death or divorce or whatever might separate you from that that individual, then you don't have other sources to rely on. You know, having a few are really important. Um, we can't just also um, rely on just one person to meet all of our our potential diverse needs. Puts a lot of pressure on that one person too. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, through your research, is there a magic number? Yeah. So first of all, that's it's challenging. Number only tells part of the story, right? It just gives you access, right? And then the quant- the quality and the functions that they serve after that are, are important. But if you don't even have that foundation to draw on, you can't really get those functions and, and quality. But what that number might be, when we look across the research, first of all, I should just mention that most of the studies look at this continuously and with often showing a dose response effect. So with every increase in level of social connection, there is a decrease in risk. However, there are some studies that have looked at, at various thresholds and what that kind of adequate number seems to be is somewhere around four to six with people who have fewer than three or four people in their network are shown to be at greater risk and people with four to six being adequate and over six showing even greater kinds of protection for various health outcomes. And so while I hate to say that, you know, there's any kind of magic number with the available evidence that we have right now, those seem to be general kinds of ranges to to potentially aim for. That's so interesting. So around four to six core people in your life. Now here's here's a I'm just going to throw this at you and tell me what you think. How do pets fit into this? Yeah, so it's really interesting because I get the question a lot and certainly we saw um during the pandemic people were getting pets to try and cope with the isolation and loneliness that they were experiencing. And there is quite a bit of evidence that has examined pets um, in terms of providing companionship and um, the potential kinds of physical health outcomes that may be linked. The benefits may occur through companionship, through um, just having uh, a sense of meaning and purpose, something to care for, but also some pets also bring us out into our community. So having to walk a dog gets us out walking and potentially bridging that gap to then, you know, say hello to other people because now you're out in your neighborhood. And so these do seem to be correlated with some positive effects. However, I do want to just give the caveat though, that oftentimes these studies are correlational and often don't have good comparison groups. There seems to be some benefits, but it's not as strong as the evidence in terms of the benefits of of human companions. (laughs) And it depends if it's a good pet or not. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. If it's going to cause more stress or not. (laughs) Well, and the funny thing is, is I've actually heard some people talk about how their pets have constrained them socially in the way that, you know, they have to leave social gatherings to get home to let the pet out because they've been, you know, the pet's been at home too long and that oftentimes they're they're having to curb some of their, their social activities because of the pet. I know it's, it's really interesting though, because there are also studies about how when you pat a dog or pat a cat, your blood pressure goes down. And like you said, it it gets you out into the community, you're walking, you're saying hi to your neighbors, and you start going on the same time walks every day, you get to see the same people. But you'll get that as well, I suppose, if you know, if you're going to the gym at the same time 
all the time. Or if you go to the library, if you're a student and you're studying, you go to the library, sit in the same place every day, you're going to start to get to know the other people who are there at the same time sitting in the same place. So there are ways to open up you know, that door to connection, to starting to talk to people. But like you said earlier on, you really have to um, make the effort and put some mindfulness into what you're doing and foster the relationships and then they'll grow. Well, and one of the things that you touched on is that consistency and regularity. And, you know, one of the areas where research has found benefits is participating in various social groups or clubs, you know, whether that's exercising or a book club or a faith-based community, many of these kinds of social participation has that consistency and regularity, like you were just suggesting. And that by having that, it's that consistent interaction that over time can start to build those relationships. And when you see the same person, you know, whether that's day after day or week after week, and then they're missing, you know, you want, you want to check in on that person, see how, you know, what's going on in there, you know, and these sorts of things can happen reciprocally, where as you get to know the other people, if something happens to you, then they are often sources of support. I think about how uh, neighborhoods and, and churches often come together to help during times, um, you know, whether it's a health crisis or your pipes burst and, and um, you need help, um, that by getting to know these people over time, they can be there for you when when things get, get rough, but also are there to celebrate the good times as well. And that part of building those relationships is that, that consistency over time. I've heard you talk before about the physical effects of uh, stress and loneliness can have on you. And one of the stats you've mentioned before is how it's correlated to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And I feel like I'd be amiss if I didn't get you to speak to that piece, because when I was reading some of the things you've written, that was one statistic that really stuck with me, because 15 cigarettes a day is something that we just know so so strongly, so clearly is just so unhealthy. How did you come to that number and how did you find that correlation? Yeah, this was based on the effects that we looked at across a variety of indicators of social connection. And we were looking at how that impacts mortality. And this is the globally available data. And we found that people who are more socially connected had a 50% increase odds of survival, but we knew people wouldn't really understand what that meant. <laughs> um, and so what we did was we tried to find other factors that impact mortality risk. So we looked at a variety of factors um, and factors that people take seriously for their health, including things like smoking, alcohol consumption, physical activity, obesity, air pollution. And we benchmarked the effect size on, on mortality risk across the known effect sizes um, at the time on all of these factors. And so what we found was that lacking social connection carries um, a similar risk or is comparable to things like smoking um, up to 15 cigarettes per day, um, excessive alcohol consumption, physical inactivity, obesity, and air pollution. Um, and so these um, were, were comparable um, and in many, and in some cases um, were actually larger. So for instance, it's, it's larger than the effect of physical inactivity and air pollution. Um, and, and so we, we did that just um, not to in any way um, compete with these others because all of these are very important for our health and, and um, longevity. Um, but rather just to help us recognize um, just how serious our relationships are for our health and that we need to take our, our relationships just as seriously as we take these other factors. As a social worker here at MedCan, and I mean, you're speaking to our population through the podcast, from a medical perspective, what's a question you think I or we should start asking our clients. We ask them about sleep, alcohol, exercise. What else should we be asking them in our regular introductions? 
You know, we do have validated assessment tools that are now linked into the electronic health record, but it may be best to simply approach it in terms of how are your relationship, ask them if there's any, any concerns, but also ask them if there's any changes. So not only um, getting a sense of, of how connected or isolated they may be, but understanding any kind of recent changes will also help you recognize where a problem, like preventing a problem from happening down the road. Because oftentimes, you don't want to wait until you have a patient who's in, in crisis. They're having a major health issue and they have no one to help support them through this um, or they are severely isolated and lonely, which of course is important to identify because that can clearly impact their immediate health and their ability to be able to adhere to any kind of treatment recommendations and their, their progression with their current illness. So from that standpoint, it's, it's very important. Um, but it also should come up earlier and where we can identify potential concerns or changes that might lead to concerns down the road to help patients start taking steps early on so that they can be better prepared and less at risk when other kinds of health issues might arise or to prevent those larger health um, issues to begin with. So it, it can occur in multiple contexts and should be happening from, you know, pediatrics to geriatrics, <laughs> that this issue is important across the life course and can be relevant across various uh, subspecialties um, and, and various types of, of uh, clinical settings. This has been such a fascinating conversation. Dr. Holt Lundstedt, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us and helping us understand why prioritizing our relationships is so important. And it's just as important as staying in shape and getting sleep and eating healthy. So thank you again for sharing your time with us and your expertise. Thank you. Stay well, everyone. That was MedCan Mind Station lead Jennifer Baldishin in conversation with Dr. Julianne Holt Lundstad, professor of psychology and neuroscience at Brigham Young University. Mental well being is a critical component of overall wellness. To book an appointment with a psychologist for MedCan's mental well being program, email mentalwellbeing at medcan.com. Follow MedCan on Twitter and Instagram at MedCanLiveWell. And check out Dr. Julianne Holt Lundstad on Twitter as well at J Holt Lundstad. That's J H O L T L U N S T A D. We'll post episode highlights and other links you can visit on our website, eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Say hello and send us a tip or a suggestion for our next episode by emailing us at info at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Eat, Move, Think is produced by Ghost Bureau. Jasmine Ratch is managing producer. Social media and strategy support is from Chantal Gertan, Andrew Imex, and Emily Bozik. As well as our interns, Amanda Serafina James and Naman Duta. Executive producer is me, Christopher Shulgin. We will be back soon with another episode examining the latest in health and wellness. This podcast episode is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation or endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with any specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan.